1915, the horrifying rumor that a Canadian soldier had been crucified to a barn caused outrage across the world. The story symbolized the brutality of the German army. After the war, the Germans claimed that Allied atrocity accusations were propaganda. But now, new evidence uncovers the real record of the German army and reveals the untold true story of the crucified soldier. The history of the First World War has traditionally been a history of trench warfare. The hardships endured by heroic troops, the massive losses sustained in futile campaigns. Conventionally, atrocities have not formed part of this history. Our image is of a war fought according to the rules, a gentlemanly war. But fresh research has revealed a darker side to this conflict. The story of the crucified soldier emerged from one of the fiercest battles on the Western Front. In April 1915, the Germans instigated a secret plan to capture the Belgian town of Ypres, which held huge strategic importance. Ypres and the salient, about five kilometers to the east, were the last parts of Belgium that were still in Allied control. And this was a war about territory and, and not an inch was going to be given up. Secondly, it was also the flank of the whole Western Front. And if the Germans theoretically broke through at Ypres, they could then turn it. We understood these positions were so important to the conduct of the war and they had to be held at all costs. Both sides had dug in. The war had become static, but the Allies held the inferior position. The Germans held all the high ground. The fact was we were under observation practically night and day from the left and the right flank. So we were under constant bombardment from all those three directions. Amidst great secrecy, the Germans had been preparing a revolutionary plan to break the stalemate poison gas. On the 22nd of April, signal flares coordinated the simultaneous release of chlorine gas from nearly 6,000 cylinders along a six-kilometer front. When the German army released the poison gas, it really changed the rules of war. Up to that point, people obeyed the rules. It was almost a gentleman's game. This was now the first time ever that they had total war. The Allies were taken by surprise. They had no defense against chemical warfare. The French and colonial troops took the brunt of the gas. They fled and the line broke. On their flank, some 4,000 men of the 1st Canadian Division watched the disaster unfold. They had little experience of combat. They have to decide whether to run or fight. And they're seeing the French troops fleeing, they're panicking, they're watching this gas, which they have no defense against, and they're watching thousands of German infantry coming in behind. And to their credit, they stood and they said, we're not going to move, and they formed in small groups and started fighting the Germans. They didn't really waver for a second. Uh, they believed in the uh, good of the British Empire, and this was one of those cases where you stood and fought. The Canadians prevented a breakthrough. 
over the next two days of attack and counterattack, the fighting came out of the trenches and raged back and forth across the fields around Ypres. It was now that the shocking rumour about the discovery of a crucified soldier began to emerge. Even Jack Davis remembers hearing it. As far as I was concerned, or anybody else that I knew of, this was an unconfirmed rumour. But the rumour persisted. Some accounts said the soldier was crucified to a barn door, others to a tree. Most reports identified the unnamed victim as a Canadian sergeant. So many stories appeared to give the rumour substance. It spread like wildfire across the front. I heard tales of friends crucified on barn doors, of wounded men bayoneted whilst lying on the ground. Talk of atrocities makes me feel quite bitter against the enemy. What happens quite frequently in such lurid accounts is that there is a kernel of truth there, that a soldier was stabbed or something terrible did happen to him, but by the time he gets back to his comrades in his unit or, or in another unit, it becomes a full-scale crucifixion. A Canadian officer came in here the other day and stated that after an attack, he and his men found a man crucified in a barn. Fortunately, they caught four German soldiers in that barn too. I am thankful to say the Canadians killed all four out of hand. In many ways, some of the most lurid atrocity stories are what we would now call, I think, urban myths. Um, they are rumours spreading through both the population in Kharki, um, and soldiers start many of these stories, and amongst the civilians, which are then subsequently picked up by the press. Was the story a myth? In 1915, few questioned its authenticity, and it swiftly became headline news around the world. German bayonets thrust 60 times into the body of a sergeant. Name of victim not yet known. Several men saw the corpse. Great sullen anger at the awful crime. During the war, the story of the crucified soldier came to symbolize German brutality. It was also a powerful weapon of propaganda and inspired Hollywood to make a film, now lost. This is a rare image from the Prussian Kerr. Even its title reflects the outrage the story provoked. Atrocity stories, of course, abounded during the war, but it was the worst possible atrocity, the worst thing that you could do to someone, crucify them. So it had tremendous impact. Even at the end of the war, the crucified soldier could still inflame public opinion. In January 1919, the Canadian War Memorials Exhibition opened at London's Royal Academy. The show featured artists who'd been commissioned by the Canadian press baron, Lord Beaverbrook. Their work recorded the contribution of Canada's forces at the front. This was the first blockbuster exhibition, certainly in London, maybe in the world. The range of the work on display was immense. One went from very traditional portraits to modernistic works. War was a traditional subject, but the exhibition had made it a modernist one. Exhibit number 186 was called Canada's Golgotha. It was a bronze sculpture some three foot high by British sculptor Dermot Wood. The image had lost none of its power to shock, leading the Daily Express to describe it as the ghastliest thing in these rooms. The Canadian soldier is really tantamount to Christ on the cross. And the Germans, on the other hand, are sacrilegious criminals. You see this wonderful juxtaposition between good and evil. 
This work served to focus the grief and the sorrow that everyone was experiencing in January 1919. That's why the impact was so great. It was the public indictment of the Germans. It was exhibited just before the Versailles Conference. People were already saying, make Germany pay. And here was a reason why Germany should pay in the sculpture itself. The story had now been immortalized in bronze. But was it true? Freiherr Langwert von Simmen, the German Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, was outraged by press reports about the sculpture. He complained to the British government through the neutral Swiss legation. A very serious allegation is levelled against the German army and spreads through the world without any attempt being made to furnish proof of the facts or to give the German government an opportunity to refute the libel. Although the Royal Academy exhibition had no official sanction, the British and Canadian governments rose to the challenge. They launched an investigation at the highest level. The governments thought they could prove that a soldier really had been crucified at Ypres. At the end of the war, the Germans were adamant that the sculpture of the crucified Canadian soldier was simply black propaganda. Their formal protest went to the highest level. In January 1919, the complaint reached Sir Robert Borden, Canada's Prime Minister. He asked Sir Edward Kemp to investigate the matter. Kemp, the Minister of Overseas Military Forces, was the driving force behind the search for witnesses. At first, Kemp's investigation went well. He found eyewitnesses, like Private George Barry, who could furnish every detail of the incident. On the 24th day of April in the year of our Lord, 1915, I was a private in the 13th Canadian Battalion, Royal Highlanders of Canada. We took up a position in the rear and to the right of St. Julian. I saw a small party of Germans about 50 yards away. I lay still, and in about half an hour they left. I saw what appeared to be a man in British uniform. I was horrified to see that the man was literally crucified, being fastened to the post by eight bayonets. He was suspended about 18 inches from the ground, the bayonets being driven through his legs, shoulders, throat, and testicles. At his feet lay an English rifle, broken and covered with blood. Barry could even identify the victim as a Canadian sergeant through the insignia on his uniform. But as other eyewitnesses came forward, alarming inconsistencies began to emerge in their accounts. Private Arthur Bull also claimed to have witnessed the crucifixion of a sergeant. Sergeant J. Wilson was crucified to a barn door with bayonets in April 1915. But Boole's service record in Canadian archives reveals that he only enlisted on the 1st of May and did not reach the front until 1916. So Boole could not have witnessed the crucifixion he described. Why would a soldier have given false testimony? It might be as simple as um, getting attention. Um, we have accounts, for example, of um, soldiers who claim to be coming back from Belgium, telling stories about German battlefield atrocities. But we actually have no idea whether this man was there or not. Uh, in all likelihood, he's never been anywhere further than Aldershot. Adrian Gregory believes that in the countryside around Ypres, 
There are clues that might explain the emergence of a crucifixion story in April 1915. These troops are being exposed to the visual culture of Belgian Catholicism with its wayside calvaries and crucifixes, which they see going to and from the trenches. And then add on top of that the terrible deaths incurred amongst the troops through the German use of poison gas, uh, which are effectively as horrific an idea as crucifixion. And then on top of all of that, the fact that this is more or less occurring over Easter. And personally, I think the emergence of a story about crucified soldiers um, is essentially really quite unsurprising. But just as the Canadian inquiry seemed to have stalled, new witnesses came forward. Like Private Barry, Private Leonard Vivian of the 3rd Middlesex also pointed to Saint-Julien as the site of the alleged crucifixion. I was in charge of number one stretcher section, which made several trips bringing in wounded from the line in front of St. Julian. We had made about five journeys, and on the sixth journey, I saw on the right-hand side of the road, on a barn door, what appeared to me to be a Canadian sergeant crucified to the door. There was a bayonet through each hand, and his head was hanging forward as though he were dead or unconscious. I did not stop as the army was retiring, and I had a wounded soldier in my care. I learned from some Canadians the same day that this sergeant was a Canadian and had been crucified for protecting an old woman. With Lance Corporal William Metcalf, Sir Edward Kemp thought he had finally found a compelling eyewitness. Metcalf was an American citizen who had heard that war had been declared whilst on holiday in Canada. He enlisted in the Canadian Army. Of course, he was underage, but back then, you know, young... Adventure, right? That's what, you know, perception of war was uh, just a big adventure. In September 1918, the Allies had attacked the heavily defended Hindenburg Line at Arras in France. Metcalfe's men were pinned down by machine gun fire. Waving a signal flag, William Metcalfe had dared walk in front of a passing tank to direct it towards enemy gun emplacements. His hip was smashed and the canteen was shot off and kilt were all shot up and helmet was riddled. And amazing, really, why he didn't get killed. Well, I asked him uh, one time <laughs> why he didn't get in the tank and he said, he said damn things were death traps so you wouldn't get in with. William Metcalf was awarded the Victoria Cross Britain's highest military decoration. Kemp thought the testimony of someone with his exemplary military record could not be doubted. On or about April 23rd, my platoon was proceeding along the St. Jean Road when I noticed a soldier pinned to a barn door with bayonets. There was a bayonet through each wrist. His head hung forward on his breast as though he were dead. I could not see any bullet wound, but did notice the maple leaf badges on his collar. We were told later that this man belonged to the 16th Canadian Battalion. The platoon sergeant, whose name I cannot remember, examined the body and we moved on. But even in the war hero's account, there was a serious flaw. It lay in the location, the Saint-Jean Road. Saint-Jean was never captured by the Germans and could not have been the site of a crucifixion. Privates Vivian and Barry had identified a much more likely site. Saint-Julien was a village that fell to the Germans on the evening of the 24th of April. Could Metcalf have simply confused Saint-Jean with Saint-Julien? That's very understandable to uh, get confused on the on a road. But you always remember the incident, what, what you saw, you didn't, you know... Like, Man won the Victoria Cross, the mil military medal twice, wounded six different times. Uh, he had no reason to lie. Uh, what he saw is what he saw. Throughout 1919, the German Foreign Ministry kept pressing the British government to produce the evidence for a crucified soldier. When they received no reply, 
they sensed the Allied case was weak. Behind the diplomatic language, their meaning was clear. Put up or shut up. The Foreign Office has the honour to beg the Swiss legation to state whether the British government has communicated the material requested by the German government. Should the reply be in the negative, the Swiss legation is requested to have the matter brought to the recollection of the British government. In January 1920, the British finally sent Vivian and Metcalf statements. They knew the evidence was not conclusive, but it was all they had. The Allies had failed to identify the victim. The witness statements were inconsistent. The Germans denied their troops were anywhere near the locations mentioned. They appeared to have scored a propaganda victory. Sir Edward Kemp knew his inquiry had failed, but he was furious when he learned his government intended to label the allegations as not proven. What the officials were doing by telling the Germans this was calling into question the depositions of the eyewitnesses. And Kemp was very familiar with their reports. He probably thought that it had happened. And even if it hadn't, we couldn't embarrass our own soldiers. The sculpture, Canada's Golgotha, became something of an embarrassment. It was withdrawn from public display and, until recently, locked in a vault in the Canadian War Museum. But was the record of the German army in the First World War as clean as it appeared? The crucifixion of a Canadian soldier at Ypres was not the only atrocity the German army was alleged to have committed. From the beginning of the war, its soldiers had been accused of war crimes against civilians. In August 1914, fleeing Belgian refugees had told of the rape and murder of civilians. There were more lurid stories too. Some said that children had had their hands cut off. It was even rumoured that babies had been speared on German bayonets. Images like these became commonplace. Cartoons, posters and newspaper illustrations eagerly portrayed the depravity of the German army. Governments, military, do need to demonize the enemy. The propaganda machine needs to continually stoke up anger, stoke up aggression against the enemy. And they do this partly by making up stories, but more effective, in fact, is grey propaganda. In other words, taking something that is true, maybe did happen once, and make it into a, a normal practice. After the war, some extreme atrocity accounts were discredited. The West now dismissed all wartime atrocity stories, including the crucified soldier. But public opinion might have been less dismissive had it known the real evidence against the German army. Much of it comes from the first few weeks of the war. In 1914, the German plan to invade France had depended on speed for success. But the Belgian army put up a stout defence from a network of strategically placed forts. The Germans had suffered heavy casualties and had been delayed. They looked for a scapegoat. The Germans thought their losses could only be explained by civilian resistance. They believed that Belgian sharpshooters, or franc-tireurs, had waged guerrilla war against them. This was a myth, a myth that would have tragic consequences. These folk tales of the German army create an atmosphere 
of hair trigger response to any perception of civilian resistance, whether true or false. So when uh, German army units open fire on each other, what we now think of as a friendly fire incident, both sides of uh, these incidents believe that they're being shot at by Belgian franc tireurs and then go off and take it out on the civilian population. This fear of the Belgian civilian population was highlighted by the events of the 19th of August. On that day, the German 8th Brigade occupied the small town of Arscott. In 1914, Gust Boschmans was 12 years old. He is now 100. My two aunts and my cousins had left. I didn't want my grandfather to be alone. I was very fond of my grandfather. I was 12, but I decided to stay with him. Gust now experienced for himself how wary German soldiers were of Belgian civilians, even the very young or old. We heard shooting behind the house, very close to. We were curious and we went to see what had happened but we didn't see anything. But suddenly, a German appeared in front of us with his revolver and said, you have been shooting? Because the German were terrified. One could see in his face that he was scared, but he could only see an old man with a gray beard and a boy of 12. He knew very well that it couldn't have been us. The Germans were on edge. When a sudden shot killed their colonel, they believed there had been an uprising. Women and children were locked up in the church. It was the prelude to a massacre outside. In Arscott, the Germans killed nearly 170 civilians. The victims included the mayor, his 15-year-old son, and even several women. The majority were accused of resistance. The soldiers systematically burned much of the town to the ground. Gust Boschmans witnessed the aftermath of the devastation. The houses on the right had burned down. On the side of the pavement, there was a corpse. And because the house had been burning, this corpse was all black and wrinkled. And I, a kid of 12, walked by on the pavement between the burnt house and the corpse. I was going to find snuff for my grandfather. The Germans needed to show their troops had acted in self-defense. In the midst of the war, military investigators traveled around occupied Belgium. Their job was to prove that German troops had not simply murdered innocent civilians. The German defence is actually strangely mutually contradictory. What they argue simultaneously is that we have done nothing wrong, um, but when we did, the Belgians had provoked it. And so we didn't uh, mass murder civilians, but if we had, it would be because of front to rear warfare, um, illegitimate terrorist activity on the part of Belgian civilians. In Arscott, the German military police commander who had ordered the executions did not personally see any armed Belgian civilians. But he still tried to imply that there had been an uprising. The shots may have been fired from eight to 10 rifles, and I gained the impression from the exactness with which the volley was fired that the attack was well organized and perhaps led by some military person. 
In fact, the German commander's death now seems to have been caused by his own trigger-happy troops, a classic case of friendly fire. But the massacre in the town was just a foretaste of an even greater atrocity. Four days after Arscott, the German army attacked Dinan on the River Meuse. The events of August the 23rd, 1914, still haunt the Belgian nation. The river and steep banks at Dinan formed a natural defensive position. A single French regiment had blown up the bridges and secured the left bank. When the entire German Third Army attacked the town, they came under heavy fire from the French positions. But once again, the Germans blamed civilian resistance rather than the French army for their casualties. When the Germans arrived, Angèle Manteau was nearly four years old. They shouted, get out, at us. The women had to get into line and join a group on the left that made its way into town. So we set off. I was a very, very heavy child and my mother could not carry me the whole time. Normally, when you have a crowd like that, one hears a lot of noise, but people were so scared that even the babies kept quiet in their mother's arms. The women and children were taken towards the town's prison on the Place Down. Angèle is one of the few surviving witnesses of the massacre of civilians here. To her, the execution of 137 men seemed to go on forever. Above all, we heard the noise of rifles very close to us. And then, in the midst of all this noise, this uproar, an officer galloped up on a horse. He cried an order, and suddenly there was complete silence. I can hear that silence, even now. Once again, German soldiers testified to military investigators that their actions had been justified by civilian resistance. Those people who were caught with weapons in their hands were lined up against a garden wall near the open space. I do not know exactly how many were shot. It may have been 50, it may have been 100. In fact, in Dinan, the Germans were now simply taking revenge on the civilian population. Towards evening, they were again shot at from the opposite bank by French soldiers. The echoes may have made the Germans imagine they were under attack from all sides. Their response was savage. They took reprisals against the innocent. Among their victims were 38 women and girls. Troops also murdered seven babies, including a three-week-old who was bayoneted. Even the most extreme atrocity stories are sometimes based on real events. Like Arscott, Dinan was set on fire and the town was razed. In total, 674 civilians were killed, one-tenth of the population. It was the worst single massacre of civilians by the German army during the war. Every 23rd of August, I feel nervous and frightened, even after so many years. Things like that scar you. New research has confirmed that the German army killed some 6,500 French and Belgian civilians during the first month of the war. 
there is overwhelming evidence that large segments of the German army behaved in what can only be described as a criminal fashion. Massive destruction of civilian property, um, brutality towards the civilian population, and murder. And so there is definitely a crime going on here. The atrocity story that symbolized the brutality of the German army in 1915 was the crucified soldier. Fresh evidence means it is now possible to resolve that mystery. After the end of the First World War, the Allies had been unable to prove that the crucified soldier was anything other than a myth. Crucially, no one had been able to identify the victim. But only recently, new evidence has emerged amongst the papers of a British Red Cross nurse. On the 11th of July 1915, Ursula Challoner was questioning a wounded Canadian soldier. Her job was to find out what had happened to missing men. Now just 12 weeks after the battle at Ypres, Lance Corporal Clement Brown passed on the story of the crucified soldier, but he also came up with a name. There was a Sergeant Bain or band, but I cannot remember the number. He was crucified after the Battle of Ypres on one of the doors of a barn with five bayonets in him. I cannot be quite sure of the name of the place. Ursula Challoner's report never reached Sir Edward Kemp's inquiry, but it seems to provide the vital evidence of identity that his eyewitnesses lacked. Could this Sergeant Band of the 48th Highlanders of Canada have been the crucified soldier? The 48th Highlanders of Canada was a volunteer regiment from Toronto. Many of those who enlisted were Scottish immigrants. Within weeks of the declaration of war, some 970 officers and men had signed up. The men who made up the 48th Highlanders, which became the 15th Canadian Infantry Battalion, were typical of any of the militias across Canada. Being kilted, it would have a certain amount of uh, honour associated with it and, and a certain amount of respect. Before departing for Europe, the 15th Battalion proudly posed for an official photograph at Valcartier Camp in Quebec. At this time, they were over a thousand strong. Most of these men would not survive the slaughter at Ypres. This photograph was taken on the morning of the 25th of April, 1915, after the gas attacks. Only three officers and 316 men remain. Harry Band, the man identified by Ursula Challoner as the crucified soldier, was born in Montrose, Scotland in 1885. He was one of seven children. His father, Robert Band, had been a house builder Harry emigrated to Canada, presumably in search of employment. His service record shows that he enlisted on the 18th of September 1914. His pay was to be sent to a Miss Isabella Ritchie of King Street, Dundee. Perhaps she was a former girlfriend. Harry Band is listed as missing from the 24th of April 1915. The three most compelling witnesses to a crucifixion had all recalled seeing a victim around this date. Private Barry had stated the 24th, Private Vivian the 23rd, and Lance Corporal Metcalf had said on or around April 23rd. Confirmation that the victim may indeed have been Harry Band has come from his family. 
During the war, they received some extraordinary correspondence from a soldier in his platoon. On the 1st of June, 1916, Private William Freeman wrote to Harry Band's sister, Mrs. Elizabeth Petrie. As a private in Sergeant Band's platoon in France, and one who went through the battle at St. Julian in April 1915, and seeing Sergeant Band's picture in the mirror as missing, I thought it my duty to write and let you know that Sergeant Band was killed. 24th of April at St. Julian, as most of his platoon and the men of his C Company were captured. I am sorry for you all and you have my deepest sympathy. He died as he always wished to, a soldier's and a hero's death. But Freeman was hiding what he had learned of Harry Band's fate. Elizabeth Petrie was a determined woman. Ever since she had read reports of a crucified soldier, she had wondered whether this fate had befallen her brother. If there was anything at all to do with the family, any problems, any, she seemed to know about it. And then with Uncle Harry, I'm sure she would have got into that really deep to find out just what happened. She'd be after the truth. Band's sister Elizabeth Petrie wrote to Private Freeman, querying his account of her brother's death. Freeman's reply stunned the family. I am very sorry to say that it is perfectly true. Harry was crucified. But whether he was alive at the time, I don't think anyone can say for sure. When I wrote to you about Harry's death, I didn't tell you all the horrible details. I thought it best not to tell you how they found him. It would only have caused you more worry, and I did it for the best. As other soldiers have told you, I expect you know all about it now. I think Harry must have thought a lot about you because he was always good to his men, and he always saw that his platoon got everything that was coming to them. He treated everyone the same and never had any favorites. You must miss him dreadfully. The letters received by Harry Band's family are very interesting. Letters from the time were always written in, in a very guarded way. He died instantly. He suffered no pain. He served his country. You know, it was always very positive. They wouldn't really want to tell anybody at home that he died some sort of terrible death. So it's quite, they're quite exceptional for that sort of detail as well. Elizabeth Petrie had another letter confirming these details, as she informed her brother Martin. I have got it at last, the horrible details. Don't tell Bertha them all. I told her he was crucified, but they took him down alive. He was all hacked to bits and spat on and his eyes out. Oh, Martin, think of it. And yet the war office has never notified me. For years, the Band family kept their knowledge secret. Even Letty Band only learned what had happened to her uncle on the outbreak of World War II. It was on the radio that war had been declared. And my dad seemed to have lost colour and he had that drawn look. And he got up and he walked away. And I turned to Mum and I said, what's the matter with Dad? And uh, she says, oh, she says, his brother was crucified in the First War. It all brought it back to him when this war w was declared. And I know that he had some tears about it. Harry Band's remains were never recovered from the battlefield. He is commemorated, along with 54,000 others whose graves are unknown, at the Menin Gate in Ypres. If Private Freeman's evidence had been available to Sir Edward Kemp's 1919 inquiry, the Canadian government would have had a far stronger case for the existence of a crucified soldier. I don't think the incident was invented. I don't think it was purely a tool of propaganda, though it certainly became one. Something definitely happened of this nature on the Eep salient in April of 1915. To me, the symbolism of the crucified Canadian is the significant issue. To the men of those times, the Germans were the devil. By releasing the poison gas, they broke all the rules of civilization. And the Canadians and the French with them were really martyrs 
So in a sense, the crucified Canadian is right in a symbolic sense. When you hear all this, there's got to be something. Yes, I'm, I think now I, I do believe it. Yeah. The mass slaughter of soldiers on the Western Front dominated post-war public opinion. German atrocities were either forgotten or dismissed as Allied propaganda. The army was never brought fully to account for its war crimes in Belgium. Until now, its brutal behaviour in the First World War has remained a hidden history. Next Monday you can see Atlantis in the Andes at 8 o'clock here on RTE2.